Welcome. We're on the red couch with Brandon B. Mike Odoms, visual artist, entrepreneur, and founder of New Orleans-based Two Cent Entertainment. Two Cent produces creative multimedia educational content that engages the hip-hop generation in social awareness. Using his strongest weapons, street art, and his video camera, Brandon seeks to tell stories, make statements, and help today's youth create change in the world. Brandon's work has been shown in a wide range of venues, from MTV to the New Orleans Museum of Art and college textbooks. He has worked with popular rappers, musicians, and film directors, including Spike Lee. He's been commissioned by such groups as Red Bull and the New Orleans Pelicans to create murals, and was invited by Scholastic to make a documentary of relief efforts in Haiti. Brandon, I am thrilled to have you on the Red Couch. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Well, I want to first talk about Two Set. Mm -hmm. So how did it get started, and how did it get its name? Okay, so Two Cent comes from um, the idiom, speak your two cent, to speak your, your voice. It's kind of like the idea that your opinion is, is, you know, being humble about your opinion. That's just my two cent, you know. So um, we started, um, a group of friends of mine, we were in college, and uh, we, we complained a lot about stuff we didn't <laughs> like. So finally it just got to the point where we said, you know, instead of complaining, let's do something. So I just challenged a bunch of my friends join together and say, okay, you're good at this, you're good at that, let's come together and create something as a whole that we feel would um, respond to some of the issues we felt that was happening in our community. So we started in um, a few years ago uh, in, at, at the University of New Orleans, and we had the mission of creating a TV show that would address issues in our community. That's what it started off as. What, are, what were some of the issues that you wanted to address? Well, initially the first episode was about... Um, I believe it was, how does hip-hop affect the community? Um, there was a lot of debates going on about whether negative and positive effects of, 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 of rap and hip-hop. And so we wanted to create like a, a TV show that responded to that in various ways. So it was like, kind of like a sketch comedy, like a variety show that um, addressed that issue. Um, and then Katrina happened, and then so a lot of our work turned into talking about some of the effects and after effects of Katrina. Um, and then we just kept moving from there. And Katrina kind of solidified your right. the whole two cent mm -hmm. entertainment world, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, before that, we were we were college students, and we were um, we had ambitious ideas, but they were kind of just like theories. Right. Um, so we we just sort of created these these this content based off of what we heard or what we experienced from from what we read in books or what we've seen on TV or stuff like that. But after Katrina we've seen firsthand like what um what neglect looked like. We've seen firsthand what um the power structure looked like when in terms of uh, being over overlooked and um and and uh feeling indifferent um or, or apathetic about uh or people feeling apathetic about your situation. So we right. we've seen that firsthand and so Katrina forced us to kind of like develop our language in, in a more sophisticated manner. And also Katrina forced us to come back together. Like after Katrina, we all were evacuated to different places around the country. Some of us were in Texas. Some of us were in Georgia. It was like 10 of us at the time. And we made a choice. We were like, okay, is two cents something we're going to take serious? Or is this just like a little fun group we're doing? And so we said, if this is something we're going to take serious, then we need to come back together and, and continue to create. So... Maybe prematurely, but we all made the decision that no, nah, two cent is something that we wanted to take serious, and it's something that we wanted to be a part of our identity. So, because of Katrina, we all moved back together, and for the specific idea of creating this work. So, Katrina definitely was like the the the, the hardening of the concrete. It definitely was made us solid, you know. So, yeah. it's been going on for ten years. Almost ten years. <laughs> I don't. I, I, it's hard to always think about that. Yeah, it's next year will be ten years. Well, Katrina was two thousand and five, but you guys started actually before. Yeah. Yeah. So officially, like this December would be um, our ninth anniversary, and then um, next year will be ten years. And so yeah, it's been ten years of working and building and and networking and failing and succeeding and yeah, ten years. So originally you worked at a public access TV station. Mm -hmm. And how did that kind of shape what you wanted Two Cent to become? Well, I, so I sat behind the camera of a public access station for from the moment I graduated high school. I interned there during high school, and then when I graduated, they gave me a job. And I worked there for five years, I think. And 
So initially my job was a camera person, sat behind camera on many shows, many shows that I would have never watched. Right. And the reason I wouldn't watch them because they weren't really geared towards my demographic. It wasn't built for young people to watch. It was kind of just people on their soapboxes just airing out their frustration. It was either that or religious programming. So it was a lot of religious programming and a lot of like community oriented programming where people were just like trying to tell the truth as they seen it or speaking on their truth um, mm -hmm. on, on camera. And um, my eyes were open to a lot of things, uh, just being around a lot of these elders. A lot of them, you know, were elders in the community. A lot of them were um, just people who had position where they seen certain things that uh, they were privy to information that the public just either didn't see normally. So being behind that camera on those shows kind of opened up my eyes to see and understand things differently. Um, and understand the role of community, understand the role of community leader. And, but my problem was that I felt it wasn't reaching my generation, which I felt my generation needed to see that information. And that kind of helped spark the idea of Two Cent because it was like, okay, how can we take this type of information but present it in a way where we compete against the things that young people are interested in. So at the time, you know, we were trying to compete with the BETs and the MTVs and say, okay, how can we package this in a way so that it's exciting and it's entertaining but it's still the same type of information. Um, so yeah, being behind those cameras in that five, six year span at, at that TV station definitely um, was a, a, a positive uh, influence on my life continuously, yeah. So how would you say that Two Cent Entertainment is different from like main, just regular mainstream media? Not necessarily the cable uh -huh. access stations, mm -hmm. but like just regular mainstream TV. Well, we try to be an alternative. We try to provide an alternative image to what's directed towards younger people. So I feel like there's a certain, um, when you think about the fact that most programming on TV and on like media in general is created by a percentage of people who don't necessarily reflect the audience. Mm -hmm. So most right, people older, point. most people, I mean, the statistic says that 6%, no, I'm sorry, 7% of all media is created by minority. That's women, people of color. 7% of that is created by people of, by minorities. So when you think about the statistic and you also compare it to the fact that the other statistic is that students spend more time in front of a TV than they would in front of a teacher. So you get to see that a lot of what you understand about other people, about other cultures, about things that you don't directly know, you learn from TV and learn from media, you learn from being in front of the computer. So the fact that if those people don't reflect you, but they're creating this, what's, what are you being taught, then it kind of makes you wonder, okay, well, who, who is telling me about some of these things that I don't understand? Well, where am I getting my information from? So what we try to do is provide an alternative to that. We say, okay, that's cool. It's cool to watch BET. It's cool to watch, you know, some of the shows that a lot of people like, but let's provide an alternative to that. They say, okay, that's there, but what happens when this is here as well? So it's kind of like a library. In a library, you have comic books, and then you got poetry books, you got history books. You know, you got to have that range of, 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 of stuff for people to, to, to take in. Um, and it's wrong when all you have is comic books, because then somebody could be like, that's not right, because you're not learning. But if you have comic books and history books, then you're okay with it. It's like, okay, yeah, read the comic books, but go pick up the history book too and learn something as well. So we try to just be that alternative um, image maker, you know, to say, all right, we're going to just show another side of the story. So when we focus on dealing with artists and rappers, we're not just showing the fact that, oh, they got all this money or they, they engage in this type of lifestyle. No, we're trying to show another aspect of it. Like, okay, what is their favorite book? Or what are they doing on their off time that's not glorified in, in, in their music? And so by providing an alternative image, we reflect certain things that people don't normally see and they get, can, can get inspired by. So, so that's speaking, a very long answer for that question. No, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. No, <clears throat> speaking of inspiration, mm -hmm. so I know you have a whole bunch of different people that have inspired you mm -hmm. and events that have inspired you, but specifically like just growing up, how did you grow up and how did that kind of shape the man you are today? Um, so I think one, okay, so my father was in the military, he was in the Marines for 27 years and we traveled. So I was initially a military brat. We lived every two years, we was in a different place. Um, so we lived everywhere from, I was born in California, Texas, um, North Carolina, Japan, Korea. Like we were all over. Before my eighth grade year, like I literally like lived all over. So I kind of think my perspective was a little bit wider than, so when I moved to New Orleans at, in eighth grade, 
my perspective was different from my peers because I had right. seen a lot. And I think just that perspective allowed me to understand that there was more to the world than just my neighborhood or my school or my, you know. So I, I knew, I was aware that there was a world out there. And that was during a time when the internet wasn't really popping. So, I mean, now people could have that perspective because they could just spend a lot of time on a computer so right. they can see, okay, there's other stuff out there. But this is, you know. But this is real life experience. Yeah, this is real yeah, life yeah. experience. Yeah, so yeah. that was definitely impactful upon me, like just having that separate perspective so I didn't fall into the same traps as some of my friends who kind of had a limited perspective on, on what was possible. Um, and then two, um, once my father retired from the military, he became a pastor. And so I was a preacher's kid, which definitely has its own um, <laughs> its own realities or whatever. So, but that also reflected upon the idea of service. So I seen my father as a as a marine in his service um, to his country. Then I seen him as a minister and a pastor in his service to to just um, individuals. So definitely, I was raised with the with the understanding of serving others and 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 being a, a tool for other people to help other people. Um, and then also, I was always creative. Um, I mean, I went to different creative schools, and, and if you create, you also learn that what you create affect other people. Mm. So regardless if you're a visual artist or a musician or a dancer or, or a filmmaker, you acknowledge the fact that what you create affects people. And you could either take that in a, in a positive direction or a negative direction. You know, you could think about affecting them in a good way or a bad way. So I was always conscious of the fact that what I created could affect people in a positive way. So I made an effort to to do that, to create and try to inspire and, and uplift. So that's kind of like the trajectory of like how I got here, I guess. And the responsibility that people have that, <clears throat> that are artists or right. Are musicians, right? We had talked about that a little bit earlier. Right, it's, it's definitely like a, a big responsibility. I mean, it's like, like the whole Spider-Man thing, with great power comes great responsibility. And a lot of people who feel like they don't have a voice, you know, if you have creativity, allows you to have a unique voice because right. people will listen to you. You know, if you, if I paint a picture, they'll listen. You know, as opposed to if I was just speaking it, or if I was on the soapbox, or just on a behind a pulpit preaching. If I if I could do it in a creative way, then people are more willing to listen. So there's a certain responsibility there. You know, as a filmmaker, you can sort of put some words together in a, in the form of moving images, and people are more willing to sit and watch it as opposed to if you just knocked on their door and say, "Hey, look, I want to talk to you about uh, global warming or something." You know, but if you could package it in an interesting production, and it's like, oh, "Okay, I'll, I'll sit and watch this." So there's definitely that idea, and I've always been curious and uh, excited about seeing other people do that. So I wanted to do it as well. You know, so. What are what have been some of the like both personal and professional struggles that you've had to overcome? Personal and professional, um, or just pick one. Pick one. <laughs> I think it's always like the idea of um, of you know your greatest enemy is always yourself in terms of like trying to prove to yourself that that you're that you're capable that you that you have the uh, the permission to even speak mm -hmm. your your. Um, your your point of view you know what I mean there's always that sort of block where nah I don't I, nobody's gonna listen to me or nah nobody cares what I got to say and and defeating that is always like the first step to you know getting to the point where you're confident and comfortable just being able to articulate whatever it is you're trying to say your truth you know what I mean and, right. and we live in a society where that's not really celebrated as much you know um we we look at celebrity we look at we look at a lot of examples of people who don't really speak on certain truths you know they don't have a platform to stand on. They just sort of do whatever it takes to to make the most money or to make the most um, fame. You know what I mean? And so, and that normally is, you know, there's not many. I'm a big fan of history, right? So I look at history and I look at everybody who, in history who, like, despite their status, like, stood on something. You know, my one of my biggest inspirations is Muhammad Ali, and Muhammad Ali had a principle where he gave up his entire boxing career just because of a truth that he had. He refused to go to war. He was like, I'm not going to war. And they were like, well, we're going to take your boxing license. That was his whole life. He built his whole life for that moment to right. get to the point where he was the champion of the world, like his whole life. And at that moment, he decided, he said, nah, that's, that's cool. He said, take it away. I mean, so that truth, there's not many, you can't, there's not too many people today that would be willing to risk their everything just on a certain truth that they have. So we don't have a lot of examples of, um, of that, and I think for me that was always like the biggest struggle to to figure out what does success look like to me. Right. Because you know once you 
figure that out, then you're kind of okay. Like if you if success to you is fame and fortune, then you know you you're just you're just like a leaf blowing in the wind. You're gonna go wherever that idea takes you. But if you have a truth, then you're gonna go towards that. So I guess that's the first step in overcoming that struggle uh trying to figure what success looks like what is what is my goal you know what i mean yeah like finding meaning in <clears throat> the things that you're doing so right. it's more it's, it goes beyond Am I just being you. boring no i feel like i'm being boring I feel not like I'm at talking all. so okay cool not at all. all right cool i'm, I'm trying to get excited Let well me, i'm talking about up. your struggles but okay. i actually want to ask you like what do you think are the struggles of today's youth um, struggles are never boring. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we always think our it, own struggles are boring, but almost everyone else can relate to them. It depends on, I, I think youth is definitely not a monolithic, monolithic term. I think there's different struggles that reflect upon different realities that young people have. I, I can speak definitely for the young people that I, I work with in New Orleans. And yeah. The biggest struggle is just this idea of um, this lack of perspective, this lack of strong um, identity, I guess, if you will, on terms of just understanding the realm of what's possible. Um, a lot of people uh, have this um, point of view where it's not so much hopeless, but it's very narrow. You know, it's, it's a very narrow path that they feel is the path that's going to take them to something that looks like success. Like, what can we do? How can what we do make a difference? That kind of thing? Well, more so like, Okay, so like every time I go into a school and talk to some kids, especially for school in New Orleans, and um, immediately everybody wants, they, 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 they're excited because they want to be a rapper. So they think that I can help them with their rap career. It's either that or, or athlete, you know what I mean? So there's like this narrow perspective of, what's, of what success looks like. Right. Because when all you see reflected above yourself is on... MTV, BET, and, and Comedy Central and ESPN, right. then you're sort of limited on what you feel success looks like. So I think one of the biggest struggles that I deal with is trying to connect a larger perspective to young people to realize that there's a whole spectrum of things possible. Um, that even if you want to be a rapper, that sometimes if you look at the, the writer or the publicist or the manager or... Like a lot of these people have less... Um, visibility, but they make more money sometimes than than an artist. So they they they're they're more secure in their career. It's not like something where they make a decision and their career is over the next day. They have more longevity. So trying to get them to see these other um, possibilities, that's one of the biggest struggles um, from a logistical standpoint. But from a mental standpoint, one of the biggest struggles is just a lack of identity, a lack of understanding that um, that they're capable of anything and it sounds it sounds cliche no, to be I like to true. tell a young person oh you can do whatever you want to do but but that's that's one of the biggest struggles to 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 kind of really bring that to reality to kind of focus on the fact that you indeed are capable of anything and it's not because of um what you see, because you're not going to see it in the, on TV. You're not going to see it in the school books. You're going to have to dig a little bit deeper, go a little bit further in your history and really understand that you are indeed capable of anything. I'm a big fan of history, so a lot of what I do with young people is to get them to connect with the past and understand that, you know what, like, and this is true for everybody, like, regardless of whatever your situation, you are your an ancestor's wildest dream. Like, that's for everybody. Like, all of our ancestors probably couldn't even imagine that we would be in this place today. And so when I get you to think about that, like, you are your ancestor's wildest dream. Now, just live in that for a moment. And then you can see your possibility. Then you can see, like, dang, that's really true. Like, I can do whatever I want to do. Like, I'm, I'm, this is somebody's wildest dream is where I'm standing at right now. So that's If I was Oprah, bit... I would have to have this be one of her aha moments. I love uh, that. Uh, <laughs> her ancestor's wildest dream. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's definitely something that connects deep. Um, so that's why a lot of what I do deals with history. Because I'm just a fan of these narratives that... Nothing is nothing is new. Like everything has been done before. If you dealing with a situation, you could read about somebody who, who beasted that situation and, and overcame it. You know, and that's true for for every scenario. You know, so. I mean, you do huge pieces, huge murals, but can you show me one of these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a. Uh... Martin Luther King. Yeah. So what I do is, I'm a hoarder, maybe a little bit, and I don't like throwing <laughs> stuff away. And so when I um. When I paint, I keep my cans, 
It's on and, an aerosol can. I yeah, so I use spray paint to do my work. And I keep the cans. I don't throw them away. Um, so these are the ones that you use for the big murals? Mm-hmm. So what happened one time, I was like, I had a, a show at Tulane University in New Orleans, and I wanted to set like a, a um, like the, the setting. So I put like a bunch of cans on the ground just because I put these pictures, these photos of the murals. So I put the cans on the ground, and I was there super early. So I was just bored. So I grabbed one of the cans and started doodling on it. And somebody walked by, and it was like, can I buy that? <laughs> and then light bulb, I had my aha moment. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay. That's great. So then, uh, so then I was like, okay. So I went outside and I painted, like spray painted the whole thing for a few of them. And I started drawing on them and I sold them all that day. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm on to something. So I started doing that. So You yeah. have a lot of different scales. I just want to read this one. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And that's a Martin Luther King quote. Indeed. I love it. It's incredible, your different range of scales. Yeah, I like to be able to work big and small. Cause, I know, that was um, beautiful. Normally, like, it's 30 feet by 20 feet, all this stuff, and then this is, like, super, I'm, like, crunched over. like. So I like to be able to go between the two. So how did you get started doing, like, street art? Um, okay, so Katrina, Hurricane Katrina has a big thing to do with that. Um, after Katrina, a lot of the city was abandoned, yeah. and there were a lot of blighted property, a lot of abandoned, like, huge structures and warehouses and stuff. Um, some friends and I got into urban exploring. We would take cameras and just go out and try to sneak into some of these big buildings. Because it was just massive to see, like, these once huge um, warehouses and structures that had a great purpose and now just sat vacant. And right. it was, like, just interesting to see the stuff you would come across. Um, and one thing that would happen as I went explored these places that I would see um, like all these huge pieces inside like that other artists had done. And it was just so interesting to me that no one would ever see this except for other people who were artists or people who would by chance explore this, these spaces. And it, it shattered all my perception of what I thought art was because I was huh. frustrated with art at the time because, I, I mean, I went to art high school that kind of drilled us to be like fine arts. You know, we were like, you know, I mean, it was a great experience, but at the end of the day, it kind of left me with, like, I don't want to do this. I, 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 my only goal was to be the best artist in that school. And once I felt like I achieved that, I was done. Like, I was like, I'm done with painting. I'm never going to paint again. Um, because I, th I felt like it was all for this sort of superficial thing, like, to get fame and, you know, that kind of put your art in a museum and put it in a gallery right. and make m m millions of dollars. And I couldn't understand why somebody piece that looked like stuff that I would throw away because I was dueling would sell for millions of dollars and then somebody else stuff would be like <laughs> struggling on the street. And I was like, man, I don't get this. So I was done with art. And But when I started exploring and seeing all these huge pieces and I'm like, man, this is crazy that these people are doing this just for the sake of doing it. Like, nobody's going to see this. They're not going to get any money. They're not going to get any fame, but yet they're doing it. And I was just so uh, attracted to that. And it's um, probably going to disappear. Right? Yeah, it's going to disappear. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's impermanent. Right. It's, it's not forever. So I was just so attracted to that um, by exploring these places. And then so as we would explore, I started bringing spray cans with me. I was like, all right, I'm going to add to it as well. So we would go spaces, and I would just start doodling stuff. And then from there, it just sort of developed. I really got addicted to it, and not because it's aerosol paint. But <laughs> I really got addicted to it, and, um, and I started to try just to perfect. And I started to try to do, like, the stuff I would see, like the bubble letters and stuff that, like, graffiti artists would do, and I sucked at it. And then I realized, I remembered, I was like, wait, but I can paint. So I was like, let me see if I can, like, apply the stuff I learned as a painter into the stuff with, with the graffiti, with the spray paint. And I found a niche that worked for me, and I, I started to grow from there. And so is that how Project B started? Yeah, pretty much. So Project B was basically, um, so one of those abandoned buildings, it was this apartment complex, this housing project um, in the Ninth Ward. It was called the Florida Housing Project, and um, it was abandoned eight years wow. at the time because this was like eight years post Katrina. And but it was brand new, like six months before Katrina. This was a brand new building. Incredible. So it had a different feel to it. It didn't feel like some of the warehouses we would explore. This felt like a brand new apartment because right. only the first floor was flooded, and it was three floors. So um, I had some friends from Arizona who were like these real popular street artists um, that I met from. I've, I've I work on some um, Native American reservations in Arizona doing some uh, media arts classes during the summer, and I met them out there. They came to New Orleans, and they were like, man, show us some place we can paint. 
So we went to this space. They ended up doing these murals out there. Like, this is all illegal. Um, so they ended up doing this stuff, and I fell in love with the place. I kept going back, and um, it was initially an illegal gray area. We would uh, sneak in, and we transformed, uh, it's like 77 units, and literally like every single one inside was transformed into like murals. And, um, and what happened was it became like an underground art attraction. Like the news picked it up. It was like um, a big media event. Yeah, yeah. It was on the front page of the newspaper, which was crazy. It was in, all in the newspaper. I got invited to do a TED talk about it. It was just crazy, like the amount of attention that came from it. And it really came from the idea of like artistic alchemy, like the idea that that we had lemons <laughs> <laughs> and we turned them into lemonade. And, uh, and that's what it really came about. It was like, because we didn't have the authority or the money or the power to transform the space into like livable housing you know we couldn't make it into something that was useful from that front but we said okay we could try to make this different than what it is we can make this something that's positive for this community because right. this place was in a community that was trying to rebuild like so all around it was people who were trying to you know working hard to rebuild their house to get everything back to normal and every day they had to leave out and see this huge structure that was just like a constant reminder of like what happened so right. we transformed the space just with some paint cans and some just creative thoughts and it became like schools were taking field trips out there like every time i would go out there to at least have 20 some people out there with cameras walking around so but then they got shut down like the powers that be the people owned it they felt it was a liability issue and they um so they came in and they they boarded up all the rooms and stuff but still it started something beautiful like it, it got everybody thinking differently about blight and about the possibility and not seeing it as or the possibility of street art too and not seeing it as a threat but seeing it as something that could be worked with and so now I can happily say that um, a year later, we are going to do the same thing, but in a legal space, there's another apartment complex that's even larger, 360 units. The last one has 77 units. This one has 360 units. Wow. Yes, yeah, so it's huge. <laughs> that's crazy. And it's privately owned, so the owners are granting, um, uh, they're granting me to get a bunch of artists to come in and, and transform it and turn it into an exhibit that will last for a couple months. So, you know, so that's going to be a, a good example to show the city, like, look, you know, this can happen and you can use artists to do some creative things. Um, so, yeah. That is amazing. Yeah, we're excited about it. We're hoping that it's going to be beautiful. So if you had one secret, one juicy secret to living a happy and successful life, what would it be? Um, <laughs> you probably have many, but just... Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I guess the, the greatest thing would be to just this, to do good stuff and share it with people. Um, I think that's 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 pretty much it. Like, just make good stuff, whatever that is. That could be cooking a good meal, or that could be like making the most beautiful book ever written. But make good stuff and then share it with people. I think that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so happy to have had I you on the red couch. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the red couch. <laughs>